Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And the word that maybe that we have for tonight, unless the Holy Spirit kind of changes <laughs> the way it comes out, is it's more of a warning for the day we live in. Amen. Many Many people are living today as if nothing's wrong. They, they can't lose their salvation. They can do no wrong in God's eyes, that everything's okay. And as long as they show up to church every once in a while, they're good with God. And that is not what the Bible says is, is accurate. We as believers must stick with God, stick to His Word, stick with His Holy Spirit, stick with the things that God has instituted to be a benefit to our life that we don't become part of the great falling away. And part of the, the we'll say the origin of the great falling away, now outside of, we'll say, Satan, demons, things of that nature, the origin of the great falling away is deception. Either it's self-deception or it is somebody else deceiving you. But we've got to make sure that we heed those warnings in these last days. Because there will be many that will run well to begin with. But as Galatians 3 says, who hath bewitched you? Who has put like a spell on you? Who has deceived you? Who has tricked you? Now, uh, one thing that Dr. Barclay points out about that verse, and we'll see if we get to it tonight. I'm not quite sure if we'll go that direction or not. But... The thing about that verse is it doesn't say what bewitched you or what deceived you. It's a who. So we've got to make sure that we pay attention to the who's that are in our life. <laughs> pay attention to the who's that are in your life. Because this is, isn't a Dr. Seuss message. But the who's that are in your life, if you're not careful, they will speak into your life. And they will pull you in a direction that you're not supposed to go. So... The, I guess the warning tonight is for us to stay on guard and make sure that we are living these last days not being deceived at all. Not self-deception, not deception from anybody else. We could say that's one of our weights that we've been talking about on Thursday nights in our series is that would be an internal and external weight would be the deception. But for us as Christians, we need to make sure that we're aligning ourselves with the Word of God, with the Holy Spirit of God, and doing what God, how, living how God wants us to live. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now we beseech you, brethren, or we, are, we ask, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, now, that shaken in mind is part of that something that's going to shake your foundation, something that's going to shake you and cause you to start looking around of what, what just happened, what's, what's being loosened in my life. Now, for maybe uh, one example that we could think of, 9-11, September 11, 2001. When that happened, there was a massive shaking, shaking that went on all throughout the America, all throughout the United States, we'll say. It really went throughout the world, but really hit home here for us in America. What happened? All of a sudden, the Bible became the best-selling book again. Many people started forgiving people and, and letting things go. Why? Because they thought, we don't know what's going to happen next, and, and I, I don't want to die knowing that I haven't forgiven this person, or I have held this against them, and we haven't talked in years, or whatever the situation is. People began to let things go and say, you know what, at the end of the day, this doesn't even matter. I'm going to forgive this person. I love this person. I want to see them one last time before something else happens. Things started happening. Things started shaking, and people started really understanding what life was truly about. That it wasn't about how much money you can make, how much this or that, or that things will always be there. It was more about what, does, what matters the here and now, not a vain lifestyle, not a, well, let me just do this now and let me sow my wild oats. No, no, no. It was a, what matters the most? And at the end of the day, it was family, God, and country. After, right after 9-11, those were the three most important things to a lot of people. Now, I wouldn't say everybody, but to a lot of people. And they were shaken 
and reminded of what meant, meant what really meant something to them. It's sad that I believe that in these last days, there is so much in the world that is shaking. Many Christians, they, they get so numb to, we'll say, the earthquakes of the world that's really shaking things up and making things kind of off kilter or what would normally, a few years ago, what would normally happen, people would say, wait a minute, that's a sign, that's, that's in the Bible, that's a sign of the last days. And they would be shaken to get things right and to live according to the Word of God. But it, because the birthing pains of the last days are getting closer and closer together, people become more numb to those things. And now it's just like, oh yeah, they're fighting another war overseas. Yeah, they're doing this. Yeah, prices are high. Yeah, this and that. Yeah, there's mud being slung everywhere. And we know it's got to be the last days. And yeah, 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 yeah. Yada, 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 whatever. And they just get so numb to it that nothing even shakes them anymore. Because there's so much that's shaking that people just, they get cold, they get callous, they just, yeah. But Paul here says that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Or that the day of Christ has come. Now one thing that we know that Paul is addressing here, that there were some people that said, well, the, the rapture, or we would say the coming of Christ has already happened. Now, that's, we know that's heresy. That doesn't line up accurately according to what the Word of God says. But that's one of the things that Paul is addressing is, look, Jesus hasn't come yet. So don't, don't be given over to that. Don't be given under these false doctrines. Don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Don't be shaken in your spirit. Don't be shaken by somebody else's word nor by a letter from us. Don't be, don't be worried about those things right now. Don't be shaken that... You know, everything's falling apart and there's nowhere else to go or be so shaken that you just start living life as well. It's going to happen sooner or later. You know, there's, there's some people that live life of, well, I'm going to die one day. I might as well get the most out of it now. That's not a way to live. <laughs> now, now, yes, you should enjoy family moments. You should be in church. Yeah, I'm going to die one day. But I'm going to be in the house of God until then. Well, okay, we kind of get that. But with the mindset of saying, I'm just going to live and sow wild oats, or live however I want to, and nobody else can tell me how to live, that's really where you start, start walking a line that is not good for you. But he says that they be not soon shaken in mind nor trouble, because when that shaking happens, that's usually when some deceiver can step in. Oh, this, this is going on right now. Well, let me help you to come in and give you the solution to all your problems. <laughs> now, Years ago, especially in the, the, the beginning of America, we'll say the cowboy days or western days, you would see a lot of these people that would go town to town and they'd have these big wagons and they'd have these crates of these elixirs, of all these things of this has got all, for whatever ails you, this will take care of it right here. This is your solution to everything. You got a bunion, this will take care of it. You got a cough, this will take care of it. You got fleas, this will take care of it. I mean, it was like they would sell it so well. Of whatever your problem was, this whatever they were selling was your solution. And many people would buy into that. Now, if you're, if you're a fan of like Andy Griffith, Little House on the Prayer, things like that, you know how that usually turns out. The whole town falls prey to whatever this person is, whatever they're selling. People get sick, hair starts falling out, whatever the situation is. It's not a good thing. But that's exactly what deceivers do, is they come in, they prey on the, what's been shaken in somebody's life, and they use it to their advantage, not yours. But these last days, that's what's going to happen, is more, more of the, as more things happen, people are either going to go cold and callous and not pay attention to the last days, or they're shaken so much that they're looking for their solution in other people. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. That's enough said right there, but that's not the end of the verse. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there be there come a great or come a falling away first. And we call the great falling away. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, 
so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, here's something I want us to think about. How many Christians in today's time have made themselves God and sit upon God's throne in his own house? That's part of the great falling away is because many churches now you come in, it's no longer we worship God. We'll sing about God, but at the end of the day, the message and everything about your experience is all about you. Isn't isn't that replacing God with us being God? What better way to deceive God's people than to make it all about us? We'll sing a couple of songs about God. We'll, lift, we'll say the name Jesus once or twice. We'll talk about God in the song. But really, every message is all about you. And every, everything that we're going to talk about, everything that we're going to offer you is all to make you feel good, to make you feel better, not, not knowing that they're falling into this verse. So let's read it again. Who opposeth and exalteth himself. Now we know that in context is talking about the son of perdition, talking about the Antichrist. But we know that the same spirit of the Antichrist person roams about in today's time and has been for, for generations and really almost since the beginning of time. But that same spirit works as much as it can to prepare the way for the Antichrist. Anyway, back to this verse. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? <laughs> Paul being the apostle, Paul being a good, we'll say, pastor in some degree. Don't you remember I told you these things? I told you, I warned you. These things are going to happen. These things are coming. I warned you about this. Don't fall for this trap. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So even the Antichrist will be revealed in his certain time. For the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of the, the hidden truth of lawlessness, doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming." So we know that the Antichrist will one day be done away with through Jesus Christ. We know that when they had the showdown, the Battle of Armageddon, however you want to look at that, however you want to title that, that the Lord's ultimately going to have his victory over this one. But for now, this spirit is still working in whom it will, whom it can, whom allow it to, because remember the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's sending that spirit out to say, who will, who will fall prey to this spirit? Who will allow themselves to fall prey to this spirit? In other words, who can we bewitch? And if it can't, like Dr. Barclay says, if it can't get to you, it'll get to your friends. Now the who may not be a spirit, if it can't deceive you directly, it will send somebody else who is who is capable of being deceived, to now deceive you. So we've got to pay attention to these things. And I'm not saying that anybody here will, but we've, we must live each and every day as we're ready for Jesus to return, we're ready for the day of the Lord to come, however you want to title that, however you want to look at that, we're ready to serve God until our last breath. Whether it's we meet Jesus in the air, or we take our last breath and we're physically gone. So... We've got to be ready for either one of those, but we can't let up because if we do, then we may be subject to this great falling away. So verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness, with all deceivableness, that means unrighteous deception. Deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth. Notice what's missing. A love for the truth. That is our answer for everything when it comes to deception. A love of the truth. When we stop having a love for the truth is when we'll be deceived. When we stop loving the truth. Well, wait a minute. I think there's a verse in John chapter 14 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. 
Hmm. So, in other words, when we quit loving Jesus, when we quit really loving His Word, it's not just, because many times, it's not just a love for Him. We say, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. But do you love Him as the truth? (laughs) They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Hold your place here. Let's go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. This was my original message, and it ties in pretty good. Amen. Let's go down. Let's go down to verse 5. So John chapter 14, verse 5, holding your place in 2 Thessalonians. We'll come back. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the means to get to the Father. I'm the truth. I'm the truth that you must love and obey to get to the Father. I'm the life. I'm the one that has the life that will, the one that holds eternal life to give it to you to receive, to reach the Father. No man come to the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Now we're going to skip over just a little bit. Verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Hmm, okay. The word keep there means to guard from loss, to prevent from escaping, to observe, to preserve, to obey. To perform. Notice Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. What did we say? 2 Thessalonians 2.10 says, Now we're going to stay in John for just a second. It says, They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So they didn't love him, so they didn't keep the truth. Jesus says, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll keep the truth. Okay? Next verse, well, let's go down to verse 17. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in you and shall be in you. That's if you're born again and if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Let's skip over to verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Hmm. Let's skip down to verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. That's the same keep in all three verses. And my Father will love him, and he will come unto him, and, and make, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, or he that loveth me not keepeth. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. That's a lot of knots. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Now we can see that even in this one chapter, Jesus talks an awful lot about if you love me. A person that loves me will keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. The world cannot receive the truth because it doesn't know the Holy Spirit. It doesn't know the things of God. He that, he that keepeth my commandment, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he loves me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. If a, man, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and the Father will love him. We can see a whole lot of love in, these, in this chapter, but it's all contingent. All of that love is contingent. So now coming back to 2 Thessalonians 2, they receive not the love of the truth. It's our choice if we have a love for the truth. That's the key word, if, in all of those verses we just read. Big two-letter word. (laughs) You mean our eternity hinges on a two-letter word? Yes, if. If we have a love for the truth. If we have a love for the things of God. If we have a love for what He says and we apply it to our life. Well, how can you say that? Because Jesus said if you love Him then you will keep his commandments. There's no if, ands, or buts in that. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If we don't keep keep his commandments, we don't love him. And then that, that means we have not a love for the truth. Because a love for the truth will not only keep us from falling from deception, for deception, but it helps us to be born again. It helps us to be saved. 
Verse 11. So 2 Thessalonians 2.11 says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now reading that in the King James, it's like, wait a minute, God's going to send a delusion on the people? So let's, I'm going to read this. It says, God withdraws His grace, leaving these people open to the reward of their deception. Because they don't receive a love for the truth in verse 10, God says, I'm pulling my grace because I owe them nothing. But it's their choice. It's our choice if we are part of the great falling away. That's the reason we must be on guard in these last days to not let anything or anybody deceive us. <laughs> now, by thing, we could say demons, we could say false doctrine, but that's usually going to be presented by a who. Even if it's a demon, it's going to be a who that's presenting that to you. So we, get, we catch the heart of that. But we shouldn't let anybody deceive us in these last days. We must be on guard. Is that, does that line up with the Word? Does that line up with the Spirit of God? Does that line up with the things of God? We must be judging these things. We don't judge people to heaven or hell. We judge their fruit, but we judge the doctrine that they hold as well. To say, all right, I can get with that because that's Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. I can agree with that. That over there, not so much. I differ with you on that, but as long as you're believing in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, we can get along, we can worship God together. But when you start teaching this whole other thing over here that undermines Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, which is the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ, we would say also the, new, the cardinal doctrines of the New Testament, then what you're doing is you're chipping away at the foundation of the whole Christian belief, which leads to the great falling away. So for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion because he pulls his grace and they receive the reward of their deception that they've chosen. Verse 12, that they all might be damned, that means condemned, who believe not the truth. So you mean they had a choice to believe the truth or not? Yes. But had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now we're getting to the heart of it. The unrighteousness brought them will say sensual pleasure. So that is the reason they choose not to receive the truth. It's the reason they choose not to have a love for the truth is because they're getting pleasure in unrighteousness. But verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to, to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. So in other words, God wants everybody. God wants all to come to repentance. He wants everybody to repent and to be sanctified through His Spirit and believe the truth. So verse 14, Whereunto He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, this traditions is not... Well, this is the way daddy done it. This is the way granddaddy done it. This is the way great grandpappy done it. No, no, no. We go with the traditions of what the Word says. Now, if that lineage, that heritage, line themselves up with the Word, well, praise God. We can stand on that. We can declare that. But at the heart of, the thing, at heart of any tradition should be the Word of God, not man-made. Not because somebody done it, because the Word says it. That's the tradition we hold. But stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Notice both of them line up with the word. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. <laughs> so he finishes up this, what we would say, chapter by breathing hope into them. Comfort your hearts. Establish you. May God establish you in every good word and every good work. Amen. So let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Start at verse 1. One of my favorite passages. 2 Timothy 4, 1 says, I charge thee therefore behold, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, 
Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. I don't see quit anywhere in there. And I don't see change your doctrine anywhere in there. But why? Because if we're standing on the word, notice it says preach the word, not what you not what you hold dear to your heart, not whatever is popular, preach the word, the word of God. Be instant in season, I see. Be ready in season, be ready out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, doctrine there means the teaching, the instruction, and produce understanding. It's what the Word of God says, we would say. Verse 3, for the time will come. (laughs) I hate to burst your bubble. It's not will come, it's now here. For the time is now here, we'll say, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now this sounds like a verse we just read a moment ago in 2 Thessalonians. Out of their own lust, what birthed the rejection of the love of the truth? Their own lust, their own pleasure in unrighteousness. So they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. That is the great falling away. That's what we've got to beware of. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. That means don't quit preaching the gospel. Don't quit sharing the gospel with with anybody and everybody. You do it. Anytime that you get an opportunity, share the word of God. Share your testimony. Be an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. That means carry out fully to fulfill or, full or confirm fully your ministry. For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. He's saying, look, look, Timothy, my time is about done. I need you to step up to the plate and to keep this word going. Now, praise God that there's many like Timothy that did. that kept it going to, for, even for us now that we could still have the truth of the word of God. That Christianity kept going. But Paul knows he can't last forever. And he's got to pass it off to faithful men according to his own word. It's one of Paul's epistles. He says, we give this to faithful men. And that's what he's doing with Timothy. He's giving him essentially two epistles. (laughs) He's saying, here, I'm going to write these letters to you. But you've got to pick up the mantle. You've got to keep this going. You've got to do this in these days. I would dare say that's the same charge for each and every one of us. We've got to keep... God doesn't hinge His Christianity upon our shoulders, but it should be each and every one of us sharing what God has placed in His Word, but also what He's placed within us to share with those around us. That we are wanting to share the Gospel, wanting to share the good news of Jesus Christ, and how others can be set free, how they can be blessed. But notice verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. He said, I've finished my race. I have kept the faith. In other words, he said, I didn't quit. I didn't fall to the deception. Even though that Peter kind of gave in to a way that didn't line up with the Word of God, Paul has to go and address Peter. Say, hey, what are you doing? Quit acting like this. You need to be more, more, more mature in your doctrine. Quit treating these other people. Quit, quit hiding. Quit doing all these other things that are being goofy and quit acting like this. Be the man of God that you're supposed to be. Paul could have easily said, you know what? Well, that's Peter. He, he knew Jesus before I did. You know, he, he, he really walked with Jesus. I only got to meet him after the fact on the road to Damascus. So, you know, I just really, I just really, you know, I, gotta, I can't speak up because it's Peter. You know, he's the rock. I mean, he's got all this going for him, so I really can't say anything to him. <laughs> but Paul didn't. Paul said, no, no, no. We, we, don't, we don't blur lines. We say the truth is the truth. Because Paul's love for the truth, he said, I don't care who you are, I'm going to let you know what the truth is. He says, if I'm going to live by it, I'm going to present it to you when you're out of line with it. <laughs> that's like even if you look at John chapter 13 at the very end of that verse before you get into chapter 14 Peter's like oh Jesus I'll go with you I'll give I'll lay down my life for you 
And Jesus turns around and looks at him and says, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. That doesn't sound like a warm and fuzzy, oh, I love you, Peter. Oh, bless your heart. Thank you for laying down your life for me. Oh, that means so much to me. Oh, you're so precious, Peter. Oh, you're so awesome. You're my favorite disciple. You know that, right? Don't tell John, but you're my favorite disciple. No, it's not what he does. He says, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. Because why? Because he knows you can't blur the lines between the truth and the not truth. You can't blur the lines. That's called deception. We must be able to draw the line and say, this is the truth, that's a lie. This is truth, that's deception. But we've got to make that stand and not waver on it. We can't waver for anybody else, and we sure can't waver for ourselves. We can't give in to self-deception, and we can't be deceived by others as well. Verse 8 says, henceforth, because he has finished his race, because he's kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not only to me, but unto all them that also love his appearing. There's that word again. When you have a love for the truth, you have a love for Jesus, you'll obey the truth. And when you have a love for the truth, you'll look forward to his appearing. Amen. So that should keep us out of the great falling away because of our love for the truth, our love for Jesus, and our love for his appearing. Of course, then Paul goes on to say, do thy due diligence, or do thy diligence to come to me shortly and begins to address some of the others in this, as finishing out this epistle. So let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 now. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, and we would say today, some shall depart from the faith. They will depart there. It means to set sail, to come out of, to withdraw from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits. Deceiving spirits, an imposter spirit, a roving spirit, a misleading spirit, and doctrines of devils. That means instruction, teaching, information, and learning of devils, of demons. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. That means not only do they speak a lie, but they're speaking a lie that they're a hypocrite about. Oh yeah, you should, you should tithe, you should do this, you should give your money to the church, and then they don't do it themselves. <laughs> That's just an example. But there's many things that people will speak in lies and hypocrisy to deceive others. Yeah, you should do this. You should really try this. And they sell it as if it's what you really should do and it's going to benefit your life, but yet they themselves won't do it. <laughs> That's like going back to our example of the person selling the elixir. <laughs> Most of the time you ask them, have you drunk this? Oh, yeah. They're lying right through their teeth. They know what's in that. They know, they know that whatever's in that's not going to help them. They just want you to buy into it. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. This is why they don't mind lying. They had their conscience seared with a hot iron. That means their past feeling. Now, other scripture would let you know that when you get to the, the point of having a seared conscience, they, your, God turns you over to a reprobate mind. And I firmly believe through Scripture, there's no coming back from that. Because at that moment, you can do something you know is wrong and feel no guilt about it. And without that feeling guilty, that's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit has stopped convicting you. He stopped doing His job for you. That means He's left you. Which means that you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit by screwing holes into what he, in His job is and what He's designed to do to help you. And when you've blasphemed him, Jesus says there's no redemption for that. But this is where many people are leading themselves and leading others in this day and age. We cannot fall for this. We've got to be students of the word. We've got to be able to call things out as we see it. Maybe not do it publicly of saying, hey, this over here, don't be part of this. If we have to, when that day comes, we'll do that. But at the moment, we've got to at least call it out for ourselves to say, that doesn't line up with the Word. And at least maybe tell those that we're discipling, those that are helping, you know, those that are with us in the kingdom, those that are helping us serve in the local house, hey, nah, stay away from that. 
That doesn't line up with the Word. That doesn't line up with the Word. And be able to call those things out. All right, so Paul, what are you talking about here? What, if, what is your example? So verse 3 says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. <laughs> huh. Now, there's a bigger picture to this, but this is two of the things that Paul is addressing that he's trying to let Timothy know, hey, these are two examples of what you know is going on. They're forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. In other words, he says, God's not going to forbid you to marry unless it's sinful. And then God wouldn't endorse that, but God would endorse actual biblical marriage, which is our Sunday school right now. But also, not to, they're also commanding to abstain from meats when he says, when God told Peter, rise, Peter, kill and eat. These things, when you give thanks, when you sanctify it, then you can partake in it because you have given thanks unto God for what it is that you're partaking of. Because it's food, it's sustenance for your body. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So in other words, our meals are supposed to be just like us. It's sanctified through the word of God and through prayer. Father, I thank you for this meal. May you bless it. May, you, may this meal nourish our body. May you help it, Father. May you help us to do your will and everything that we need to do by giving us the, the, the nutrients we need from this food. We thank you for this food. You're the so- source of this food. We thank you. Yes, we did pay for it through the job that we received. But, Father, it is you that gives us the ability, the, the power, the ability to obtain wealth. It's you that's given us that job. It's you that's helped us. So, Father, I thank you for this meal. And I thank you that it is clear and and sanctified, set apart, no choking, no salmonella, no other issues, Father. We just declare it's healthy and it's good for our body because of you, because we serve you and because we give you thanks. Amen. And then we shout down and eat. And what does that do? That helps us. Helps our bodies. But it's also how we sanctify ourselves. Father, help me to do your will. Help me because you're my God. You're the one that has blessed me. You're the one that has helped me. And I thank you for helping me, God. Verse 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Huh. You mean when we remind people what the Word says, we're a good minister of Jesus. Yes. That's exactly what it says. Let's read it again. If, uh uh-oh, there's that big two-letter word. If thou, meaning you, put the brethren, notice it's brethren, It doesn't say pagans. If you put the brethren in remembrance, that means fellow believers. Because you can tell a pagan all day what the Word of God says. They may or may not give ear to you. Because to them, if they're not ready to receive the Word of God, they're not ready to partake in what God's offering them or what you're offering them through God, then they're just like, eh, that's not for me right now. Because you gotta, you got to remember, the Holy Spirit also must be drawing them to God through Jesus Christ for them to receive what God has for them. Because Jesus says if, if a person is not drawn by the Spirit, then it's kind of like it's not, it's not going to do you any good. But as we know that the Holy Spirit is faithful to draw us until either he's blasphemed or that person has just completely went past all their options of giving in to God and allowing God to be their God, then it's kind of fair game. You can just kind of test the waters. Say, hey, here's what the Word says. But if you, you're not really going to remind them of what the Word says because they don't care anyway if they're a pagan. They haven't chosen to submit to the Word or submit to God. So here, again, we see, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Not bad doctrine, not illegitimate doctrine, good doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Refuse old wives' fables. (laughs) Now, that means the fable is a religious story without sound doctrine. It also means falsified facts. (laughs) falsified facts. They say that if you do this, 
then you will live a longer life. Well, who's they? I don't know. It's just they. Well, who's that? It's a false, probably a falsified fact. Now, sometimes we say that we don't correctly remember the study, whatever we saw, but many times the they is a falsified fact because somebody started it to see how far it would get. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Profane or old wives' fables. In other words, having a religious story without any sound doctrine. That reminds me of a lot of messages going forth today. I'm going to say that again. It reminds me of a lot of messages that go forth today. <laughs> it's a religious story without any sound doctrine. Amen. We got we to gotta be mindful that we stick with the word. We stick to the word. We should be word people. But we refuse these things. And we exercise ourself rather unto godliness. In other words, we exercise godliness in our life. You exercise godliness. Well, why would I exercise godliness? Because you have a love for the truth. Because you, want, because you love Jesus Christ, you're going to obey the truth. You're going to keep his commandments. You're going to keep his word. Then verse 8 says, For bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, that's not an excuse not to exercise and to keep your body in good shape. <laughs> but it profits a little because your body's only temporary. But godliness is profitable unto all things. That means anything you do regarding godliness will benefit your life. Having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is the faithful saying and worthy of all exception or expecta- acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. So in other words, there may be, there's going to be labor, there's going to be a little bit of reproach because we trust in the living God. Yeah, but it's par for course. But, yep. Mock me all you want to. I may have a little, little reproach. Yep, I work for the kingdom of God. It's not a, it's not a bed full of roses. It's a labor. <laughs> it's a labor of love. Amen. And why? Because we love the truth and we love Jesus Christ and we will keep His commandments. So that's where the labor comes in. It's a labor of love. We both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. Why? Because our faith is in Him. Who is the Savior of all men, especially to those that believe? These things command and teach. So in other words, Paul is telling Timothy, command these things and teach these things to the people. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in lifestyle, in charity, in your love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Now we know that he finishes out. Well, let's finish out. We're, we're so close. Let's just go ahead and finish it out. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. That's what should be in every church service. Now, I would say with maybe the exception of the move of the Holy Ghost, where people are being, they're, they're breaking free from things and being set free, and they're rejoicing and shouting, and then it's just like, the Holy Spirit is moving, we don't even need anybody to speak. We're just going to worship God. We're just going to let the Holy Spirit have His way. But on the regular, we'll say regular service, we give attendance to reading, which is what we're doing, to exhortation, which is what I'm doing, and to doctrine, which is found in the Word of God. Neglect not the gift that is in thee. Now remember, he's talking to a pastor. Neglect not the gift that's in thee. That means there is a gift in the fivefold ministers. There's a gift in the local pastor. I'm not saying that to build myself up. I'm saying that because any fivefold ministers, that's the reason... I must keep a right heart toward my pastor because if I don't receive him as my gift from Jesus Christ, it only hurts me. It doesn't hurt my pastor. It hurts me. But here we see kind of the flip-flop. He's telling Timothy, don't neglect the gift that's in you. Use your gift to benefit the body of Christ. And I would dare say that applies to all of us. Don't neglect the gift that God's given you. He's given each and every one of us a gift because we're part of the body which was given thee by prophecy, by, with the laying on of hands, with the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine, and unto the doctrine continue in them. For in doing so, thou shalt, save both, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now the New Living Translation, that same verse says, Keep a close watch on how you live and your teaching, Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those that hear you. That applies to all of us. 
Now, for me as a pastor, absolutely. I've got to watch the way I walk with God, not only for myself, but also for you. Because if I allow deception in me, self-deception of saying, well, this is okay for me, then that same deception that's in me is going to breed in you. Not even if I teach it to you, it, because it'll come out of me, that same spirit that's ministering to me will minister to you. So that's the reason that all pastors, all fivefold ministers must be careful of how they live and keep a, a definite eye on what they're doing, what they're partaking of, what they allow in their life, because it not only affects them, it affects everybody around them and everybody that hears them. But for any of us as Christians, because remember, we're all supposed to be evangelists. We're all supposed to share the word of God. So we've all got to keep an eye on how we live, especially in these last days that we don't allow deception at any rate in our life. That we may not only make heaven ourselves, but help others make heaven. Amen. So let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Just a couple more verses and we'll be done for tonight. Galatians chapter 1. We'll start at verse 6. Galatians 1, 6. Here's the danger of the great falling away. Now this is Galatians. Now remember, this is chapter 1, what we would consider chapter 1 in his epistle to the Galatian church. Verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed. You're so soon turning away from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, unto a different gospel. That's deception. Which is not another but there be some that trouble you. There be some who would say that deceive you. They're troubling you. They're being the fly in your ointment. They're being the issue that is coming against you. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. That sounds like today. They pervert the gospel. And they trouble you when you hold sound doctrine. Why? Because you are holding the truth, especially when you have a love for the truth, you are opposing them and they don't want you to oppose them. They don't want you convicting them. They want you to pervert yourself along with them. So if they can present it unto you for you to be deceived as well, then they've done their job successfully. But that's not what God has established. We don't pervert the gospel of Christ. We do not pervert the gospel of Christ. That is part of the great falling away. Verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven, Mormons, black and white right here. Let me say this again. But though we, he's saying even himself, if I present to you another gospel that doesn't line up, or an angel from heaven, because it's Probably not an angel from heaven. It's a demon passing himself off as an angel of light. That sounds like another verse. Yes, that's why it pays to be word people. Amen. We or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Let him be anathema. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preaches, so he's, he's pastoring right now. He's got this repetition thing going. <laughs> As we said before, he's like, drill sergeant Odom. It would behoove you, as we've said before. So I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than what you have received, let him be accursed. <laughs> For do I now persuade men or God? Do I, or do I speak, or do I seek to please men? Of course, the answer is no. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So in other words, if it's pleasing to your flesh, it's not of Christ. <laughs> now, you can say, but Jesus is my hope. He makes me feel good. That's good, because that should speak to you in your spirit, man. That there is a hope, there is a peace, there is a love, there is a joy. Not to your flesh. 
When the doctrine pleases your flesh, it's not of God. When a doctrine pleases your spirit, man, then we know it's of God because He's not only going to correct you, rebuke you, and fix you, He's also going to give you hope and encourage you and bless you in your spirit, man. Because you've got to remember, in the Word of God, in the, in the things that all pertain to the kingdom of God, within us, there's going to be a spirit man and there's going to be a natural man or a flesh man, and they're going to contend with each other. And whoever you feed is the one that's going to win. So we got to feed our spirit man so that any doctrine that would feed the flesh and please it is not going to be of God because God says your spirit man. We're to be led by the spirit, not by the flesh. That automatically tells us that's actually in some of these epistles that we're reading if you study these out a little bit further. But verse 11, but I certify you. I certify you, I make it known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. It's not according to man. For I neither received it of man. He said, I didn't receive it from anybody else, from another man. Neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. But here's here's the thing that's so profound. Paul says, I didn't receive any of this from another man. I received it from Jesus Christ. But... All of his epistles and all of his doctrine goes all the way back through the Old Testament and is built upon it and carries it through to what we would know now as the the dispensation of grace. Our dispensation, the current dispensation that we're in, the church age. But what does it do? It doesn't, it's not contrary to anything God had already established. If anything, it builds upon it. It reaffirms it, builds upon it. But he says this revelation, this came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, again, if we have this doctrine that pleases the flesh, it's not going to be of God. If it challenges our flesh and pleases our spirit, man, then we could say, yep, that's going to line up with the Word of God. And we would have Scripture to back it up. Amen. Last verse, Galatians chapter 2. So going over just a few verses. Verse 1, Galatians 2, 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation. I went up because of revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation. So notice he goes privately to those that were of reputation. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren. You got to know, not every brethren is accurate and true. Because of false brethren, unawares, that means because they secretly brought in, who came in privately, or privily, we would say they came in by stealth, to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus. In other words, they're spying out our liberty to say, how much can we push them until, how, what's the limit we can push them? How much, how much can we get them to do without them realizing that we're pushing them out of their liberty of Christ? How much, how, much can, how much room can we take in their doctrine to push them further into where we want them to go? Which we would say this is manipulation, it's witchcraft. When you start maneuvering people to where you want them to go, that's witchcraft. That's like even as a pastor, I would love to maneuver some of my sheep to say, let's come over here. This would be safer for you. But I can't make you do that. I can lead you to water, but I can't make you drink. I can lead you through the word of God, but you've got to make the choice. Because if I have control over you, that becomes a different story. We're no longer a house of God. Now we're a cult, which we are not. Having that control is what a dictator would do. But a, a true local pastor would say, this is what the word says. And either you're going to choose God or you're going to choose the flesh. Either you're going to choose to obey the word or you're going to choose to refuse the word. So at the end of the day, I just lay out the choices before you through the word. Amen. And it's your choice. But they privately or privily spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Notice 
their whole motivation is to bring you back in bondage. Why? Because they are in bondage. Misery loves company. <laughs> but it's, it's all deception. It's all deception. So verse 5, last verse. To whom we gave place by subjection. To whom we gave place. So, so to whom we did not yield in subjection. So the footnote in my Bible says, no, not for an hour. <laughs> Paul says, we, we didn't let these knuckleheads even have room for an hour. We didn't subject anything to them for not even an hour. So that means he probably gave them a few minutes to let them speak, to say, all right, I'll subject to hear what you got to say. Then after a few minutes or at least less than an hour, he's like, no, this doesn't line up with the word of God. Why? Because we should be able to judge. As Christians, we should be able to judge the fruit and the doctrine that's being presented unto us to say, nope, that doesn't line up with the Word. Nope, that doesn't line up with the Word. Or, yep, that does line up with the Word. We should be able to judge it. We should have enough Scripture written on the tablet of our heart to be able to judge things. Or at least allow the Holy Spirit to recall and to bring to remembrance things to say, nope, that doesn't line up. Or, yep, that, that, that resounds. That sounds... That sounds like doctor. That sounds like the word of God. That resounds what other verses I know that say. But it says, "To whom we gave place by subjection, we did not give, we did not yield to. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you." Notice he didn't say that it would continue just with us. He says we didn't subject ourselves to them so that the gospel could continue with you. Why? Because Paul knows there's more at stake than just him. He knows if I don't nip this in the bud, if I don't be like Barney Five, if I don't nip this in the bud, this is going to affect the Galatian church. This is the reason he writes this to them in this epistle. Look, this is going on among you guys. You got to cut this out. I didn't subject to them for not even an hour. You guys should not be giving them room. Don't allow them to speak in your time of gathering. Don't allow them entrance into your life. Don't let them spy out your liberty. Don't let them deceive you in any regard. So may we as Christians, may we take to heart this warning of the last days, this great falling away, that we don't fall prey to such a, to such a spirit, to such a thing in these last days. Because as we march closer to the end of time, we've got to be more on guard of such deception. Because it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the word even tells us that if the days weren't shortened, the very elect would be deceived. So we must be on guard, not paranoid. So don't misunderstand me. We don't get paranoid. We just judge things, which is what the word tells us to do. Judge that. Does that line up with the word? Nope. Not ta- I'm not partaking in that, not listening to that. Does that line up with the word? Yep. All right. I can, that's, that's safe for me for now. <laughs> So I need to go back and judge it every so often to make sure it's still right. And then we judge things and we're being led by the Spirit that we don't fall into this deception. Because these are the last days and we cannot afford to play games with God. Because we cannot afford at all to play games with God. Because not only does our here and now is it at risk, but our eternity is at risk if we fall into this great falling away. Because the way that it will work is this deception weeds itself, or we say worms its way in. It begins to deceive, and then it begins to breed new things, and then it grows into a seared conscience, which turns over to a reprobate mind, and then you're lost forever. So we cannot give any foothold, as Ephesians 4 tells us, don't give any foothold, don't give any room for the devil. Don't allow him any room. But my friend's not the devil. They may be listening to a demon. They may be listening to a devil. Doesn't mean they're the devil. They just may be listening to one. So judge everything that comes out of everybody's mouth. A lady told me one time, and I I took it. I knew she wasn't meaning it correctly, but I took it with a grain of salt. But I told her, she said, I'm judging everything you say. I hadn't been pastor here very long. She said, I'm judging everything you say. I said, go right ahead. Judge everything I say according to the word. And, if I, and I said, if I miss say something, come to me and bring it to me. That's like this morning, I accidentally said Boaz and Naomi. And I was like, oh, 
It's like, really? Come on now. That's like Moses building the ark. Come on now. It was Boaz and Ruth. Amen. But it's hindsight's twenty twenty. But anyway, it's one of those situations where I'm like, J- judge me by the word. Judge everything I say. And if I start getting goofy, I start teaching you things that are, don't line up with the word of God, then by all means, either bring it to me, call my pastor, or leave. And with that, at least give me the decency to say, Pastor, I think you're wrong with this. I think you're wrong with that. And let's sit down and at least talk about it. So that way, if I can say, hey, you know what? You're right. I, mis- I misspoke or I-, I got that out of context or I missed that up. Let me ha- give me a chance to correct it. So, because that's what we need in these last days. Because didn't, didn't we just read, if you bring these things to remembrance of the brethren, you are a good minister of Jesus Christ? He didn't say there's any exclusions. Just like we talked about Paul. He could have had an exclusion with Peter. Well, that's Peter. That's the rock. We, no, no, no. He says, I got to go and talk to him. Now, he didn't do it in public. He went to him and talked to him and said, hey, no, go ahead, fix this. <laughs> but Peter wound up correcting it because he gave him the opportunity, which is what Jesus says. If you have ought against your brother, go to them. If they, don't, if they don't receive you, then take two, two, two of their witnesses. And if they don't receive you, bring them before church leadership. There is a method to all of this to keep us safe in the things of God. We've just got to know the word and obey the word because of a love for the truth to, to, to fulfill and obey the word, to follow through with it. Amen. But we've got to have that love and know the word to know what to do. Amen.